Thanks, so I think it's about 12.30, so I think I'm going to get started. So thank you all for sticking around through the afternoon on Sunday. Hope you're having a good Linux Fest, and it's really nice to be here again. Uh, I know some of you were here yesterday for our Ask the EFF and Friend panel, and uh, thanks to those of you who've come back. I've been talking to a lot of people about this topic at the conference, and I've realized it's sort of a sprawling area, and people may have very different interests. And I'm thinking of the XKCD comic where they refer to nerd sniping, which is like catching nerds by showing them something interesting and having them get really into it. And then they get so distracted by the shiny nerdy thing. And I'm sometimes a little bit afraid that I've actually been nerd sniped on this topic um, by experimenting a bunch with software reverse engineering, where that might not actually be the part that most people care about or even find the most relevant for policy purposes. But I'm going to talk about a wide range of things here related to surveillance and encryption policy, uh, some technical things about reverse engineering. I hope everyone will find something interesting. And feel free to ask whatever questions are more focused on your area of interest. Um, so I found a picture of the toy version of the PKE meter from the movie Ghostbusters. And I'm meaning to buy one of these and see if it works for anything. I'm not really sure what exactly it measures. But this is a device in the movie Ghostbusters that was meant to detect um, psychokinetic energy, which is associated with the presence of a ghost. And certainly, in a lot of folklore about ghosts, there's some physical thing that you can use to detect whether a ghost is there. Um, and so that's sort of a starting point. It will take me a little while to get to what kind of ghosts it is that I'm looking for here, various reasons why they may be uh, tricky to turn up. So to me, this all started back in the first crypto wars. So as with World War I, and as with the first Battle of Bull Run, uh, at the time, people didn't necessarily know that there was going to be another one. So you know, they used to call it the Great War. And now that there's been another World War, we say World War I and World War II. So I think in the same way, during the 1990s, a lot of people who were working on privacy issues and encryption policy were saying, oh, we're in the crypto wars. And then they seemed to sort of end around 1999. And um, <clears throat> you can sort of dispute exactly what years they cover, but I think 1992 to 1999 is pretty credible. Um, and this included a lot of things that I found personally very formative. Um, I'm not sure if some of you were involved in this in various ways, if some of you were spectators to this, um, as I largely was. This period included a lot of conflict between civil society and programmers and tech companies and governments about the right to use and access encryption technology. Um, and this is a long story, and we could certainly talk for hours about all of the colorful personalities and exciting conflicts and dramatic moments throughout the 90s where people fought about the right to use encryption. Um, this included the original cypherpunks, uh, a bunch of people who were very proactive about trying to learn about cryptography, trying to apply it to everything to enhance privacy, with a very deep and very radical vision about electronic privacy. Uh, EFF was involved in something called the Bernstein case, where we sued the government on behalf of Daniel J. Bernstein, who's had a very long and distinguished career in information security subsequently. At that time, he was a graduate student. And he was running afoul of legal provisions that restricted the export of cryptographic technology outside of the US. And he wanted to publish some of his ideas online. And he wrote to the government and said, is it OK if I publish this? And they said, actually, you need a license to publish encryption technology because we consider that to be an export. So EFF represented Bernstein and sued the government. And that's also a long story. Um, we got at least some courts to agree with the idea that code is speech. That was where that idea was first um, most developed by EFF. And we got the courts to recognize that there was a First Amendment issue, a free speech issue, about the right to publish encryption software, uh, which at the time was very novel. And subsequently, I think a lot of people have gotten more used to that idea, potentially more comfortable with that idea. There were lots of other things. There was a book with the source code of PGP with checksums to help you scan it, because the government was not interested in restricting the export of a physical book. 
but they were interested in exporting, uh, restricting the export of a file online, restricting the export of a floppy disk. So MIT Press published the source code of PGP, the encryption application, in a book. And there were checksums on every line and checksums on every page so that if you scanned it and then you had an error, you could find exactly where the error was very quickly. Um, and that book, sure enough, was bought by someone outside of the US, scanned in, and published online. Uh, so that was an interesting experience. There were people who were getting, at that time, tattoos of Perl implementations of the RSA encryption algorithm, because the government seemed to suggest that maybe you weren't allowed to export implementations of that algorithm. And people said, what if I have it tattooed on my body? Am I allowed to leave the country? Um, people were very political and very creative about this. And I've been finding it's interesting to be you know, further and further removed in time from the first crypto wars and have some of these things become a little bit less familiar to people. But it's a really interesting story. Um, EFF also built a machine to crack the US data encryption standard, which was an obsolete cipher that the government was still arguing was secure enough for all civilian use, potentially more secure than civilians should even have, but in any case, definitely secure enough. So EFF built a machine to crack it. It worked. That was one of the things that really accelerated the development of AES, which we now use today instead of DES. Um, anyway, there are many, many things from this time period. There's a book called Crypto, back when crypto meant cryptography and not cryptocurrency. Uh, this book describes the crypto wars, describes that kind of conflict throughout the 90s, and ends on a very sort of triumphalist note, like, hey, we won. The technology people won. The privacy people won. The hackers won, and the government lost. And this is over. And that's definitely the way that it felt at the time that this book came out. Um, and it's a really great book. It's just that it sort of has history ending, and it's like, OK, great, now privacy is safe. Don't worry. And that's not exactly the way that it turned out. And I think this really took me by surprise, and it really took a number of people by surprise, because it seemed from about 2000 until about 2010 that the US government, at least, was not really trying to restrict the availability of encryption tools anymore. That they had pretty much given up on trying to you know, control or deter public access to encryption. And to me, all of a sudden, around 2010, we started hearing speeches from law enforcement people saying that they viewed encryption as an obstacle to law enforcement, which is the kind of thing that we heard quite a lot from them in the mid-90s and then hadn't really heard in between. Um, so these are just a few of the events that I would associate with what we now call the second crypto war, which is still ongoing. Um, it includes all sorts of events. It includes people really becoming a lot more aware of the scope and scale and intrusiveness of electronic surveillance aware of, at, at some level, aware of how much money governments are spending on it, exactly how much data they have the potential to collect, um, all kinds of concerns about that. A lot of law enforcement agencies around the world are now talking to each other more actively to try to coordinate their understanding and their strategy about these things. And so there will be international law enforcement conferences where prosecutors or police or other kinds of officials will go and talk to each other about how do we talk about this? What kinds of initiatives do we want to pursue? And we've seen in several countries governments attempt to block particular apps. Um, in Brazil, this is pretty interesting because state courts have issued orders in Brazil on several occasions ordering WhatsApp to be blocked in Brazil for people to be blocked from using it because state prosecutors would go to Facebook, the owner of WhatsApp, and say, we want this information. And in many cases, the reply would be, we don't have that information. We can't give that information to you. And some of the state prosecutors would say, OK, our remedy should be blocking the use of this app in our country. And a number of state court judges in Brazil have gone along with this. Generally, the blocks have been reversed by courts of appeal very quickly. But it's something that's happened recurrently. And I'm actually going to go to Brazil in June to present a class to state prosecutors about how encryption works. And we'll see if I end up convincing them to stop trying to block WhatsApp, 
Or if when they hear my presentation, they say, we're all the more convinced that we really need to block this thing. Um, that's not the outcome that I'm really looking for, but we'll see how it goes. Make sure you're able to come back. Yeah, um, I think I'll be able to come back. I think it will be okay. We've been invited by the Brazilian government to give this presentation. Nice. Um, so I think that will be quite enjoyable. Huh? You'll definitely learn. Yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, it will be happening in June. So, okay. So yeah, I was saying, you know, it seemed for about a decade that actually governments had sort of made their peace with the idea that, okay, civilians actually have encryption tools and can use them, and that may mean that there are things that governments can't know or can't know as easily or can't access or can't access as easily. And in the past decade, or the past almost decade, that seems to have reversed, and a lot of governments have said, no, no, this is a problem, actually. This is still a problem. It's possible that one reason that this has happened, one of my colleagues was pointing out that the past decade has also seen encryption become very mainstream and very convenient in a lot of settings, in a way that it wasn't necessarily before. So we at EFF have worked on creating the Let's Encrypt project, which is a certificate authority that provides free certificates for your website. Um, I've given a couple of talks at Linux Fest in previous years about that project, but that's an example of one of many things that's been making encryption a lot more convenient and a lot more mainstream and a lot more used. And perhaps things like that that have been very successful and that have gotten, have moved in the direction of mass adoption have antagonized some of the law enforcement folks more because maybe they've said, okay, well, if you have a few nerds who are using PGP, maybe that doesn't bother us very much. But then if you have something that's really convenient that millions of people are using, maybe that does bother us in a different way and on a different scale. And so we've seen, as with the 90s, a bunch of proposals again from governments that there ought to be another copy or another route of access. There ought to be another copy of your decryption key. In the 90s, a lot of these proposals were the government should have a copy or a government contractor should have a copy. And people didn't like that very much. The trend that we're seeing in a lot of the more recent proposals is tech companies should keep a copy. So if Apple is giving you security tools, according to some law enforcement folks, Apple should keep the ability to then break or undo those tools. <coughs> or if Google is giving you security tools, Google should keep the ability to break that security. Um, and that's been much more of the direction of the advocacy that we've seen lately, that the provider of the technology should retain some way of getting access. And there are lots of debates about what that might be. So I'm not going to talk about most of those. I don't mean to suggest that this ghost thing is the only proposal, or that it's the most prominent proposal, or that it's the most likely to be adopted or brought into practice, but it's interesting. So I'm going to talk about that here. There are a lot of other things that we've written, a lot of other panels that have happened about other kinds of backdoors, as we would say, or exceptional access mechanisms, as law enforcement proponents would say, meaning ways for them to get access to your communications or devices in exceptional circumstances. Um, so yeah, we have a lot on the EFF website that we've written about a number of these proposals reasons that we object to them, concerns that we have about them. I wanted to talk especially about what's going on in the UK and in Australia recently. That's been making a lot of programmers worried. And then a specific facet of that, which we call the ghost proposal. Okay, so there are these two pieces of legislation from the UK and from Australia. There's a whole backstory about spy agencies and law enforcement from the so-called Five Eyes countries getting together at a conference. They have a conference just like this, except probably there's no window and probably someone sweeps the room for bugs and you have to have a security clearance and everything. But otherwise, you know, it's just like this. Someone gets up and talks about random ideas and people comment on them. And they're talking about what are we going to do about this encryption thing? Um, so there's a whole backstory. And one account that we've heard is that the UK and Australian governments said that they thought they had the political situation in their countries where they could try more aggressive policy proposals with respect to encryption compared to, say, the US. 
And Australia in particular has pursued some very, very aggressive policy responses to governments not getting access to encrypted data. And um, those have scared a lot of people. They've been very concerning. So the earlier thing that happened was the Investigatory Powers Act, uh, now three years ago in the UK. And there were some implementing regulations that were issued just last year that try to clarify more what the UK government can do under those powers. And they have a mechanism called the Technical Capability Notice. And this is a kind of order that can be given by the government secretly to a tech company. And it tells the tech company to do something to acquire a particular capability to break the security of a particular product. So that's pretty scary. The Australian Access and Assistance Bill, which passed last year, is scarier for various reasons. One of the reasons that's been especially of note to programmers and system administrators is that it has provisions that more explicitly call out the prospect of having the government direct orders to individual people. So the government could perhaps direct an order to you if it concludes that you're the person who's in the position to get the Australian government access to some kind of communication service that's being offered to Australians or that's available to Australians. And so in the UK case, we envision that these orders might be issued secretly to tech companies. The tech companies might at least have lawyers who then go and argue about it and perhaps get the UK courts to narrow what's being asked for or not force them to do it or something. But in the Australian case, one possibility, and it's not to say that this is the primary mechanism that they are using or will use or intend to use, but under the terms of the law, they can issue an order to a person who has the ability to do the thing that they want to be done. That person actually does not have to be Australian and does not have to be in Australia. What? Yeah. So they could issue an order potentially to one of you under certain circumstances, even if you're not Australian or in Australia. Now, it may be hard for them to enforce that order if you're not in Australia, because they presumably can't, for example, arrest you um, here in Washington State for not complying with the Australian order. But it might be a concern, for example, if you're planning to visit Australia in the future. <clears throat> and you violated the terms of this order, then you might have legal problems when you visit Australia in the future. So I think that even people who don't live in Australia may be rather concerned about that. Um, these orders also are very secret, and so if you disclose the existence of the order, you would be breaching the terms of the order. Um, so this has bothered a lot of people. There's been a very recent panel at Libre Planet uh, just a couple of weeks ago focused on this topic and focused on the concerns that individual programmers have for the, um, you know, potentially remote, but potentially real possibility that the Australian government might come to them and say, you have to change the software that you're writing and don't tell anyone. Um, so I think that Libre Planet panel has been recorded. Is that right, John? Yeah, it'll probably be up next week. Great. So if you're especially interested in the Australian um, situation, you can hear my colleague, Danny O'Brien, who's worked a lot on this and some other folks at Libre Planet talk about this and talk about more of the details. Yep. Um, uh, would it be possible for this um, private individual to consult a lawyer, or would that be a breach of the secrecy? <clears throat> so that was a concern that um, came up a lot. The question is whether you could consult a lawyer if you get one of these as orders a as a private individual. That was something that came up a lot in the US with regard to something called national security letters. Uh, which became a lot more powerful and a lot more used following the enactment of the USA Patriot Act. Um, now, our lawyers have emphasized that the idea of a national security letter ordering a programmer to change the functionality of software is a misconception, and that national security letters in the US, although they're very secret, are asking for data that already exists to be turned over. They're not ordering people to do anything and everything. There are other kinds of secret orders that may exist in the US that may purport to order people to modify technology, to modify code, but national security letters are not that. But the national security letters had exactly that problem at the outset, that they would say, you're not allowed to tell anyone about this. And a lot of people who got them 
interpreted the literal language to say, oh, I can't even ask my lawyer, because that would be telling someone. Um, so a very minor benefit that we got at one point was an amendment to the law so that the national security letter should make clear that you can consult a lawyer. Um, we haven't seen any of these orders under the Australian law. They may have happened, but we haven't seen them. Uh, I don't mean to say that they don't exist. I just mean to say we don't have a copy of one. I believe that the Australian law does say that you can consult a lawyer, even as an individual. Um, hopefully that's something that's discussed on the panel. If you watch the recording from Libre Planet, um, it's focused specifically on the provisions of that. Um, but this has bothered us a lot. We've definitely been worried about this. A lot of people have been worried about this. So one idea for what might be in one of these notices is something that we call the ghost or the ghost user. So I know I've taken quite a while to get to what the ghost actually is. Um, here's how the ghost was presented publicly on the group blog Lawfare in November of last year. Uh, so this is two folks from, fairly senior folks from GCHQ, the, one of the spy agencies in the UK. Um, they say, a potential solution could be to go back a few decades. It's relatively easy for a service provider to silently add a law enforcement participant to a group chat or call. The service provider usually controls the identity system, so it really decides who's who and which devices are involved. You end up with everything still being end-to-end -end encrypted, but there's an extra end on this particular communication. Um, so the British government is no longer using the term ghost, but they used that term informally in some conversations that they had about it. And we kind of like that term, so we're sticking with the, calling it the ghost. <clears throat> and so the idea is you might have a messaging tool, and the messaging tool has group chats. And the group chats normally have a list of participants, and you choose who the participants are. And the ghost idea is, well, maybe the service provider could add a participant, and that participant would be a law enforcement. But the service provider perhaps could modify the software in such a way that the software doesn't tell you when that participant has been added. So that's the ghost proposal. So people have had a lot of things to say about this idea. Um, to be clear, we don't know whether or not any government has tried to actually get a tech company to do this. For example, if the Australian government had tried to get a tech company to do this, it would be secret. And we wouldn't know. They wouldn't put out a press release, probably, like <laughs> Australian government attempts to order a tech company in the US to implement this feature. So we don't know. So I'm treating it here and in our advocacy about it as just a proposal that might be attempted in the future. And I got very interested, one might say even nerd sniped, in the question of could you tell as a technical matter if they've done this? Could you see something anomalous? You know, you feel a, cheer, uh, you feel a chill in the air or something. <laughs> you say, I feel like GCHQ has added a recipient to my conversation. Something is spooky here. Okay. So there is a side note about does this even matter whether it's detectable? Right, so we, we wrote this up uh, also on Lawfare. We have a lot more detail about the ideas that I'm going to discuss today. Um, and someone who actually agrees with us on the policy, Mike Spector said, the EFF made one of the worst arguments I've seen thus far. And his view is that these technical details are just not very relevant in this way to the policy issue about whether the ghost will work in the sense that um, we're looking at a very narrow set of ways of detecting something. And they're not necessarily detecting the thing that would actually be done in practice. And we're looking at, we're looking from the point of view, assuming that the governments consider it very, 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 very bad if there's any way to tell if there's a ghost in your conversation. And it's possible that they might sort of compromise and they might sort of say, you know what, we don't actually mind if there's a difficult and somewhat unreliable way that you could theoretically tell that most people can't use on most devices. And so 
it doesn't matter. So there are reasons that law enforcement might not consider the detectability in the way that we've conceived it to be that relevant or that interesting. Okay, so in this proposal, there's some kind of way that in a protocol you can send a join event to have a new device join a group chat. But normally when those events happen, you know, in WhatsApp, in Signal, in IRC, in all kinds of communication protocols, in Telegram, uh, in iMessage, you get some kind of notification in the user interface that someone has joined your chat. That's the normal case. And so with the ghost, there needs to be some kind of modification to the code so that the user interface is no longer accurate in showing you who's in the chat, in showing you that this event has occurred. Now, there are all sorts of interesting things about that, right? Um, I'll talk a little bit about software freedom issues at the end, like does this really involve an assumption that users can't modify their software? Seemingly it does involve that assumption. Um, I was really interested in the question of could we detect behavior at a technical level related to the existence of this event? And we've had a lot of ideas about that. And a lot of these ideas are starting with a sort of treating the communication software as a black box because it seems that the government folks who are making this proposal are assuming that there's an official version of the communication tool that you're getting from someone else and you can't modify it and you don't know exactly the details of how it works. And obviously that's not really true for everyone's experience of communication tools, but that's sort of the best case for the government or the case that they seem to be most hoping for in this case. So one idea is code coverage testing. The idea is that there must be some code in the tool that's almost never used. And it's just used in the case where the ghost is activated. It's the ghost code. And if you could tell which parts of the program are used normally and which parts are not, perhaps you could see an anomaly there. Like, hey, my chat application is using a part of its code that it's actually never used before. Why is that? And then the other idea um, that I worked with a bit is CPU utilization. So the idea is, well, you have to do math in order to do encryption. I'm going to talk a bit more about this on the next slide. You have to do math in order to do encryption. OK, well, that means if you do more encryption, you have to do more math. Shouldn't it be possible to notice that even if you don't know exactly how the tool works or exactly what the tool is doing? Hey, the tool worked harder than usual. Why did it do that? OK, so to talk a little bit about the cryptography in communication tools, um, and this could also be a long digression or a long discussion, but typically the actual contents of communication get encrypted using a symmetric encryption key that's usually called a session key. And the idea is that that's the actual bulk encryption mechanism, that if you're typing a message, that's getting encrypted with the session key Session key is random. It's probably created by whoever created the message or created the session. And a key feature of the session key is that each message only gets encrypted once, regardless of how many people are going to read it or how many devices are going to read it. And so the session key is a symmetric key. It's the same for encrypting and decrypting. And it needs to somehow be distributed to everyone who's a participant, who's an intended recipient. And in that way, the distribution of the session key connotes membership or authorization to read the messages. So if you are trying to chat with three people, you're trying to email three people, ideally, you're making a session key and you're trying to make sure that it gets to those three people and only those three people. OK, so a simple way of doing this would be if each participant in your communication has a public key you could encrypt the session key once for each public key. And that's exactly what PGP does. Um, so as messaging encryption goes, this is considered a fairly low-tech traditional way of doing it. With PGP, each recipient has got a public key. When you write a message, PGP makes up a session key, encrypts the body of the message once with that session key, and then encrypts the session key itself once for each intended recipient. 
for the public key of that recipient. Um, and that's usually using AES, which is symmetric encryption for the encryption of the body with the session key, and then usually using RSA, which is asymmetric public key encryption for the recipients. There is an interesting wrinkle that's been getting a lot more attention recently, and it probably should have gotten attention longer ago. What happens if your private key gets compromised or gets disclosed later? So for example, suppose you're using PGP and you're using PGP for 10 years. And then at the end of the 10 years, maybe you're crossing the border and the government takes your computer and your PGP key is on it. Well, that PGP key is able to decrypt all of your PGP messages, including messages from many years earlier that you may have deleted off of your computer, but if the government was wiretapping you years earlier, they have the encrypted version of those messages. And if you've now crossed the border and they've taken your laptop and it's got your key, well, now they have the decryption key, so they can go back and read those messages from many years earlier. So we say that PGP in this regard lacks forward secrecy. It doesn't actually maintain confidentiality of old messages if the secret is disclosed later into the future. And it could be many, many years later, right? In theory, there could be messages that a government or someone else has intercepted many years ago, and they're encrypted with a key that still exists somewhere. And if that key gets disclosed, you know, 20 years from now, it will still work to decrypt those old messages. So there's a sense that you can never be sure that the messages are going to remain secret as long as the decryption key still exists and as long as someone may have intercepted the messages. Okay, so there are messaging systems that don't have this property. We say that those messaging systems have a forward secrecy property. Um, so I think I'm not going to go much further into that, but typically they use constructions based on a mechanism called Diffie-Hellman key exchange, uh, which was also devised around the same time as other public key encryption, but not very widely used for messaging until relatively recently, actually. Um, and I think I'm going to skip over this discussion because I think many of you may not be into the public key protocol stuff. But the basic idea in terms of ghost detection is that for many different kinds of communication tools, the number of public key encryption operations, whatever kind of operations they are, that happen should be proportional to the number of public keys that are authorized recipients, which is to say the number of devices that are authorized recipients of the message. So if you have seven devices that are authorized recipients, there should be seven public key encryption operations, or maybe seven public key encryption operations for each individual message that's sent in the chat. And so if you have eight instead, all of a sudden, there should be eight public key operations instead of seven. So there should be this proportionality. OK, so the simplest way of detecting a lot of these without looking at the code is to look at how much multiplication your computer does. Because a lot of this is based on number theory, a lot of the encryption and a lot of the decryption operations involve doing a lot of multiplication with very large numbers, um, often exponentiation, which is implemented by your computer as a repeated multiplication. So the public key crypto math is doing a lot more multiplication than anything else that your computer will be doing in the course of communications. Now, you might have a computer that does a lot of multiplication for some other reason. Like if you're playing a video game, there might be a lot of multiplication to render 3D graphics. OK, but if your communication app is doing multiplication, why is it doing that multiplication? It's doing it in order to encrypt or decrypt something with a public key. So anyway, I tried this. We wrote it up. Um, I found it kind of fun. I took GPG. I took a tool from Intel called PIN, which is a very low-level application profiling tool from Intel. Um, I'm happy to say to our FSF colleagues in the back that I've subsequently confirmed that you don't have to use PIN, which is proprietary software, but you can instead use a tool called Dynamo Rio, 
which has roughly the same capabilities and is free and open source software. Uh, but when I did the experiment, I was using Intel's proprietary tool. Um, it's free of charge, but it's proprietary. You don't have the source code to the entirety of PIN. And PIN lets you really look at a lot of things about what software is doing, even if you don't have the code to that software. Um, it's really pretty cool. So some of you may have used something like S-Trace. Um, so S-Trace is a great tool that you can use to see what operating system calls is a program making as it runs. You don't have to use source code at all to look at that. You can say, OK, what is this program asking the OS to do? And that can give you a lot of ideas about what the program is doing. So things like PIN and Dynamo Rio are operating at a much lower level. And you can actually get, in this case, opcode counts. You can actually say, what instructions did they call in the CPU and how many times? Um, and I found that pretty fun. I have somewhere here, let me pull this onto the screen here. This is the piece that we wrote in Lawfare. Well, maybe not. It doesn't like that for some reason. I don't know why. Um, that's really pretty odd. Maybe they, we found a ghost here. Maybe there's a ghost in this adapter. Yeah. Well, okay. Anyway, this is the piece that we wrote in Lawfare describing these experiments. And basically, I took GPG, the um, 90s cypherpunk era email <laughs> encryption software. And I simulated sending an email to different numbers of people. And the idea here is we could simulate having a ghost user by having one of the users be BCC'd, blind carbon copied, by the email software itself. Right? So you could have your email software like Thunderbird or Exchange or Outlook or um, various things, right? And you could have encryption features so that it encrypts your emails to different recipients. And then you could have, OK, it still doesn't like that. That's interesting. I'm not really sure how I can show you this if it keeps blacking it out. OK. Would you hear the projector changing the sound it makes, too? Huh? If you hear the buzzing of the projector, it seems to change. The it's interesting. I was going to mention something like that in another context. <laughs> um, so that's great. Um, <laughs> What's that? The, the calculations, 124 to 48. Yeah, that's right. So what we're seeing in the right column here, um, and I can show you this on the command line with a much lower level summary, but this was an attempt to write for like policymakers. And so we just put one number. And the number on the right is the number of times that the CPU instruction called IMUL for integer multiply was called by the encryption program while it was running under these different conditions about emailing different numbers of people. And this was a fun proxy for how many encryption operations it did. And basically the idea is as we keep adding people, we get about 100,000 more multiplication operations for each recipient of the email, regardless of whether anything in the user interface is telling us that that recipient exists. In order to encrypt to that recipient, the software has to actually do more math. And that math shows up as more multiplications. And the Intel pin tool was able to see those multiplications happen and tell us how many there were. Um, so I thought that was a really fun demo. Uh, right? And so we're saying if Alyssa is logging how much multiplication her computer does, she can easily determine the number of encrypted recipients. Here it happens to be the first digit of the number of multiplications. Her computer has to do the substantial extra mathematical work to encrypt the message to the ghost recipients. Um, OK, so right, we can see the increase in the number of IML instructions. The code coverage idea also kind of worked, but it's a lot more fragile because, so we, we ran Dynamo Rio and looked at which parts of the program actually get executed or not. And it can produce statistics about that. The biggest problem there is that we don't really know which parts of the program are and are not supposed to be executed. So the tool can show us, yeah, your computer used a part of the program that it never used before. 
But we don't really have a good context for knowing what that means. Because we would want to be able to do a controlled experiment. Like, oh, let's use the app with the ghost, and let's use the app without the ghost. And then we'll see which parts of the app run, and we'll be able to make a rule to detect it. But we can't actually trigger the ghost. Right? We can't actually make the app add a ghost user. And so we don't really know whether the unusual functionality was the ghost user or whether it was something like, oh, you used an emoji that you had never used before and it had to run the function to render that emoji, right? And so I think there's a real problem about um, an extremely high likelihood of false positives if we just try to warn people that their computer is running code that it doesn't normally run, right? There may be many, many reasons for that and most of them are a lot more likely and more common than the UK government is secretly spying on you by having your app vendor trigger some spying code. Okay, so one thing that some people said in response to this is, well, but it, uh, like uh, Mike Spector, who has a great last name for commenting on this, <laughs> who was very critical of us, was one of the people who said, well, you can just engineer around that because you can make it always encrypt to a ghost recipient and just have it be a real ghost when they want to spy on you and an imaginary ghost when they don't want to spy on you. And then there's always a ghost and so you're not learning anything. Now there are some oddities about this from the point of view of the way that this was presented. For example, the proponents of the ghost idea suggested that it would be a trivial change to pretty much all existing communication apps. And having a secret user who sometimes exists and sometimes doesn't exist, who's present in all conversations and doesn't harm security at all, except when intended to, is probably not a trivial change. So I think our argument is not that you couldn't make surveillance mechanisms that couldn't be detected in this way, but that really surveillance mechanisms that couldn't be detected in this way don't represent the kind of trivial, superficial, almost cosmetic change that the proponents of the ghost initially argued. They would actually require some real re-engineering work. And they would also use more resources because you would need to have the protocol send more data and you would need to have your computer do more math all the time in order not to have a detectable difference, a detectable change in the conditions. Um, yeah, so I wanted to say before I um, finish up with the software freedom considerations. I found this really interesting because I don't have a lot of background in reverse engineering. And I started playing with some of these tools and it was a real reminder, you know, um, I'm gonna say some things in support of the Free Software Foundation's ideology. So I'll start by saying something that's a little critical of it, that Richard Stallman has often said for years, oh, if you have binaries <coughs> and you have proprietary software, you have no idea how they work and no idea what they do, and you can't understand them at all. And you know, there's a whole discipline of reverse engineering, and there's a whole field where people look at different effects and consequences of software running on systems, and infer things about its behavior, and infer things about its functionality. And I think it's really sort of fun and interesting to play with, hey, even without looking at the source code, what can I see in terms of what's going on on my computer? You know, are there times when my computer uses more CPU resources? Are there times when my computer accesses the disk? Are there times when it accesses the network? Can I see certain patterns? Can I learn from them? And then can I use some of these other tools that just detect certain events and infer things about what the computer is doing? And I did want to mention, you know, um, if people haven't tried it, you can take an AM radio and tune to a frequency typically like a multiple, um, an integer multiple or divisor of your CPU clock frequency or certain other frequencies and just have the AM radio near your computer. And you can pretty reliably hear that the sound on the AM radio will change a lot depending on what your computer is doing. And I think it's a, like, it's a really interesting instructive experience for software people who might just think, oh, well, the computer is just there and it just like runs software and, you know, like, wait, there's a physical effect based on the computer's activity. 
it's a very observable physical effect based on the computer's you know, activity or inactivity. Uh, you'll start doing some kind of arithmetic on the CPU, and you'll get lots and lots of noise in the radio spectrum nearby the computer that's not present at other times. So I just think that um, you know, it's really interesting to try to play at other layers, at the hardware layer, at the OS layer, and say, well, wait, what is my computer actually doing? How active or inactive is it? What can I learn from this? Um, OK, so to, oh, and I, you know, there's a, um, a researcher in Israel, uh, Professor Tromer. Um, if we have time afterward, I might pull up a few of his side channel things. Because he does a lot of work with things like that. Like, OK, what information is your computer revealing in the radio spectrum? What information is your computer revealing with the electric fields? What information is your computer revealing with how much noise it's making? You know, he's found cases where if you have a very sensitive microphone and you're listening to the computer, you can actually extract secrets from the computer because there are components that actually buzz more when the computer is doing certain kinds of things and buzz less when it's not. And if the microphone is sensitive enough, you may be able to make distinctions that allow you to learn about the computer's activity and maybe even the data that it's processing. So again, there are just a lot of other layers on which the computer and the software activity exist. And it can just be very interesting to poke at those and see what can be learned from them. Um, yeah, so I thought, especially being at a free and open source software event, it's really interesting to think about the way that some of the government folks have talked about this and thought about this and how that connects to free software. So it really seems to me if you read some of these proposals, there's really a lot of background assumption that users can't really understand what their software is doing and definitely can't modify it. That if the government tells a tech company to change what a program does or doesn't do, then that's what's going to happen and users are just going to be subject to that. And it seems like that's pretty contrary to a lot of our experiences and a lot of our ideals around software like Linux and other free software environments, where we have the idea that we can actually know what it's doing and change it. And that just doesn't seem to sit very well with the paradigm that a lot of the law enforcement folks have been assuming here. Um, you know, there are also, in parallel to the ghost idea, there's a lot of discussion from law enforcement about compelled software updates, about making a software vendor ship an update that instead of fixing a software bug, introduces a vulnerability that would allow the government to spy on you. And that I've given also some talks about that idea um, here at Linux Fest and in other places about update transparency and can we see if everyone's getting the same version of the program and reproducible builds, can we tell if the version that you got was compiled from the same source code that's public. But now, I think more than at any time in the past few years, a lot of law enforcement people are really talking very concretely about, oh yeah, you know, if we can't unlock a device, we should be able to make the device vendor push a software update that the device will take that will then unlock the device for us. And that's something that a lot of sort of paranoid folks in the information security world have speculated about. And I think now it's something that's just becoming more concrete and more plausible as something that governments may attempt to do. Um, and so I think that free software may really run into a lot of conflict with governments attempting to use jurisdiction over software developers as a way of implementing power and as a way of gaining access, right? Because if you're a free software developer and you're trying to say, I shouldn't have arbitrary and unlimited power over my users, I shouldn't be able to tell my users what their computers are and aren't going to be able to do. And then a government, the Australian government, the US government, any government may come along and say, oh yeah, I expect you, the software developer, to make this program work this way or not work this way and make the user's computers do this or not do this. Well, that's going to be in a lot of tension with free software ideals. And so you could view this as free software potentially is protecting people more against these things or that free software is at risk because it will antagonize governments. And we're also seeing a lot um, in the Ask the FF panel, we were talking briefly about this, about App Store censorship, that governments in many places around the world are telling App Store maintainers to take particular apps out of the App Stores 
because the apps let users do something or are aimed at facilitating something that the governments disagree with. And it's amazing how effective that's been, especially on devices and platforms where the app stores are the main or only ways that users get particular tools. So, you know, you might write an app that has some kind of privacy feature, but a government in some jurisdiction might say, we think that privacy feature is inappropriate and we don't want app store maintainers to let people get it and use it. So I think that's going to be a conflict also that will only heat up more. So I want to say I don't really have a tidy conclusion. Um, we did some fun experiments with counting how much multiplication uh, encryption software is doing. We think we can see how many recipients there are. Various people say governments may not really care about this in terms of the concrete deployment of the ghost concept because if you can't run software as root on your device, if there's a high false positive rate, if it has to be recalibrated for every release of a messaging tool, um, you know, it may just not be very likely that the actual target of the ghost may be able to detect it. And so ultimately the governments may say, okay, great, under ideal conditions you found a way to detect this, but our surveillance targets are not operating under those ideal conditions. So, you know, maybe it's not really a knockdown argument against the ghost proposal. Um, we don't really know the status of this because of the high level of secrecy. Uh, we obviously would like to know more, but if the Australian government is out there talking to tech companies, we're not in the room hearing what they're asking them to do or telling them to do. Um, and again, I think, um, you know, it's pretty fascinating to just look at, hey, what can you see about the behavior of software? What can you infer about what the software is doing? Um, I think often the answer is unexpectedly a lot. Uh, so again, there are other venues and other talks where people are going to be talking more about the second crypto war. There are many other policy issues going on about that. Please do take a look at the recording of the Libre Planet panel when that comes up uh, next week. I think that will be really interesting. And uh, thank you all for coming and bearing with me. Um, yeah? Uh, you mentioned uh, in the case of binary only, how do you know that everybody got some deals compiled for the same? I don't know if you noticed polymers uh, here in the exhibition hall and they scramble binaries. That's exactly what they do right. to reduce the, uh, the easy attack surface uh, you know, for things like buffer overruns. I actually meant to talk to Polyverse about that. Yeah, so Polyverse is trying for other security reasons to make sure that everyone gets a different binary so that it's harder for an attacker to know how to take advantage of vulnerabilities in your binary because it's different from someone else's, um, which I think is a legitimate security interest. And so, um, yeah, in other contexts we wanna say, hey, are you getting the same software update that everyone else is getting? And indeed, with the sort of most naive way of using the Polyverse tools, the answer would be no, definitely not. Um, anyway, I'll talk to them about that. I think that's interesting. Um, I've had conversations with Mozilla about something like that. And I don't think that it's necessarily an insurmountable problem. You just have to be a little bit more sophisticated about how the user can check that the binary was changed in a way that was non-malicious. Yeah? Uh, I was just gonna add on to that. What Polyverse is doing would the hash of the, but not, shouldn't affect the count of instructions run to collect it. So your other method yes. would still be valid between the versions. Yes. Yeah, so there might still be behaviors after Polyverse has changed the binary that would still be observable. Um, that would not be changed. Anyway, I know this is. Uh, fairly technical stuff, fairly down in the weeds, but uh, it touches on a lot of things that I know that a lot of us care about. And so thanks again for being here. Uh, I will be at the EFF booth if people want to come chat more about this. There are lots of other things we can talk about. Um, I do think we're about out of time here, so we should probably wrap up, but have a great rest of your Linux Fest and a great afternoon here.